if I was a member of Congress, if I was a Republican member of Congress, I wouldn't be sitting down talking about a spending bill. I wouldn't be talking about an infrastructure bill. I wouldn't be given, I wouldn't be sitting down with the Democrats and negotiate anything until they show me one thing they, they're going to do is to secure the border. Look, this security border, like I said before, it's just not about illegal immigration anymore. This is the biggest national security PRE this country has seen. Welcome to another episode of Counterculture, the show that stands at the intersection of reason and faith in the battle against sentimentality. Our guest on this episode is Thomas Holman, who served under President Donald Trump as the acting director of ICE, U.S. Immigration and Customs Enforcement, of course. Holman was conferred a presidential rank award as a distinguished executive by President Barack Obama. Wait, what? The same Tom Holman we see on Fox News was feted by Obama? Yeah. In fact, Obama elevated Holman to executive associate director of ICE back when Trump was still hosting Celebrity Apprentice. So we'll talk about that. Holman has spent his career in law enforcement, first local and then federal. He rose to national prominence during his time in the Trump administration as the frequent target of the Open Borders Caucus's ire for his philosophy of zero tolerance for illegal entry, which included a defense of the routinely demagogued family separation policy. Well, now the kids in cages raging has given way to Dems on defense, offering an anemic welcoming city pander that isn't winning the day in New York or Chicago any more than it is in border towns in Texas or Arizona. The calls by AOC and the Socialist Spice Girls to abolish ICE have gone the way of defund the police, as millions of more Americans have had their stylish cosmopolitan views confronted with the ugly urban consequences. We are a country of immigrants, but without secure borders, we're not even a country. Can we once again be both? If so, what would that take? Tom Homan, is, Tom Homan has the experience and expertise to help us answer these questions, which is why we're pleased to have him join us on this episode of Counterculture. Tom, thank you and welcome. Hey, thanks for having me. I, I wanted to begin with this uh, report that recently came out from Customs and Border Patrol uh, for FY 2023, in which uh, we find 1.3 million gotaways and more importantly, even than that, maybe, or sort of they're connected, uh, given the backdrop of the uh, Hamas attack in Israel uh, and the Iran-sponsored terrorist attacks on American troops overseas, is the part of that report included that 736 terrorist suspects had been stopped at the border in fiscal year 2023. So, I mean, just for a mo- and and by the way, now there's the announce the CBP is saying, hey, um, we are on alert at the border for Hamas or other Iranian backed terrorists to try to sneak in north or south. Um, So, I mean, just before we get into sanctuary cities and the and the migrant problems in big city America, I mean, right now, uh, as always, the first uh, layer of urgency is our national security. You're exactly right. Thanks. That's a great question, because For two years, for two years, I've been screaming about the national security crisis that they've created on the southern border. Um, You know, fentanyl is bad. Kill over 100,000 Americans. Sex trafficking women and children, bad. But I've been saying for two years, what concerns me is are the the known as suspected terrorists, the people on the terrorist watch list who've been arrested, but more importantly, those that got away. Now, your number on gotaways is actually 1.7. 1.7. 1.7 million people have are, are known gotaways since Biden's taken the White House. And for people to know, how do you know what a gotaway is? They're caught on camera traffic, video traffic, or central traffic. Where they're recorded as entering the country, but they weren't apprehended by border patrol because they're so overwhelmed. So people need to understand this humanitarian crisis that the Biden administration self inflicted that brought you know millions of people across the border, it overwhelmed the border patrol. To the point that, on average, on average, 70 to 90 percent of agents are no longer on patrol. They're off patrol. They're in facilities processing, changing diapers, making baby formula, making hospital runs, taking people to airports. They're not doing their national security duty patrolling the border. When you take 70 to 90 percent agents off the border, that's when the fentanyl comes across to kill 100,000 Americans. That's when the, uh, the sex trafficking of women and children cross. 
That's when the, the gang members and the criminals cross because they don't want to turn themselves over to get vetted to the Border Patrol. But most importantly, that makes this border vulnerable to people that want to harm this country, people from you know, terrorist-related countries. Here's what people need to understand. Border Patrol has arrested people from 171 different countries. Some of these countries are sponsors of terror. They've arrested 700, more than 700 of them. So here's my question to you, or to your listeners. If you don't think a single one of that 1.7 million didn't come from a country sponsored terror, then you're ignoring the data. This is the biggest national security failure I've seen this nation since 9-11. And I tell you, I, I, the other day, I took some heat from the left for saying that, but I'm going to keep saying it. I'm convinced, based on my experience and looking at the data, that a known suspected terrorist probably crossed our border. How many? I don't know. But someday we're going to find out. It's going to be a bad day for America. Well, I mean, of those 1.7 million gotaways, you would think that, I mean, you know, if, if uh, Border Patrol is being overrun and... Uh, this is not exactly something that is unknown to America's enemies. You would expect that some would be even caught on camera where we know that person is on the watch list or affiliated with this, uh, 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 you know, that person matches up. I assume the technology, face rec facial recognition stuff. That person is that person that we know is affiliated with the terrorist organization and they're in the country and now we're trying to track him down. I, I, that's, that's must, that must have happened. It, and, 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 or I, I understand what point you just made, but there, there is technology in the field. However, people need to understand, when we say we need to vet somebody, we vet them in, in existing databases. So if, if people come across the border, we'll run through NCIC, III, which is you know our criminal uh, record. However, many of these countries that sponsor terror don't have any sort of records, uh, electronic right. records to match against. But unless you were... Uh, encountered in a battlefield and uh, DOD took your uh, eye retinas and, and face uh, picture and fingerprints or unless there's intelligence that you're involved with some sort of terrorist or connected to a terrorist organization there are a lot of terrorists in this world there is no record on so we don't well, sure. know well and this is why FBI director Christopher Ray is all of a sudden talking about the prospect of uh, lone wolf attackers again and that the FBI is on high alert for lone wolf attackers this is this is post 9-11 redux Right, look, the Afghanistan withdrawal was a terrible, but they've released thousands, thousands of terrorists whose sole purpose in life destroyed this country. And and people need to understand why there's so many things that cross the border. Well, because I'm not stupid. And second of all, we created all these databases after 9-11. I was there. So 9-11 terrorists got a plane ticket. They got a visa coming to the United States and do the harm. After 9-11, we created all these databases. You got the ESA no-fly list. You got the FBI screening database. You got the visa security program, which I used to run. The visa security program has prevented thousands of people from getting a visa to the United States because there's some some sort of derogatory information found in the various databases that we run, including the databases. What terrorist in the world is going to put himself in a position to be, get a plane ticket or a visa, knowing that he'll be vetted, knowing he may be outed on this, when he can simply get to Mexico, pay the cartels a little bit of extra money, and enter the United States the way 1.7 million others did. It, it, that, the, the, the terrorists are going to use the route of least resistance, and that's on the southern border. Let me ask you about that, too. I mean, just because the post-9-11 uh, you were talking about and um, the expansion of the surveillance state and, and uh, the alleged integration, better integration of federal, state, local law enforcement, so how good is it uh, at the border? I mean, do we still have agencies siloed where the databases aren't talking to one another? Or, you know, uh, two decades later, is it pretty good that whatever information we have available is available to uh, Border Patrol and the relevant agencies? It's better than it has been, but it's, it's still got a long ways to go, again, because many countries just don't have records. I mean, if you want to find out if someone has a criminal history in El Salvador, you're not going to find out if they don't have those records. If you want to find out if someone has a criminal history or an affiliation in uh, Afghanistan, you're not going to find out because ISIS owns all the information. But to the but, to the extent but, that to the to the extent that 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 the FBI has some information, the CIA does, and and uh, uh, Border Patrol does, and and other law enforcement agencies do, is that fully integrated now? I won't say fully integrated. It's better. There's still some things to work through, but. Here's what here's the issue with this administration. 
And I know this because I had two different Border Patrol whistleblowers contact me and tell me this. This administration, you know, they haven't done a single thing to slow the flow. Only thing they're doing is sending more resources to the border to process quicker and release quicker. Because if there's no overcrowding, then then they claim nothing to see here, no crisis here. But here's the problem with that. Two different whistleblowers I talked to said when they arrested somebody and they run into, they vet them through the FBI, that it may take up to 48 hours. But they're in such a hurry to release them, they're told to release people to prevent overcrowding. And two days later, they come back, the guy's hot. So we know that they're not waiting for full vetting from the FBI. We just or look, we just saw that in Afghanistan, we had the Office of Inspector General for DOD said they did the same thing for all the, many of the Afghanistan nationals they brought over. So it's only as good as you use. But if you order your agents to process release quickly and don't wait for the vetting to come back, then whatever we have is useless because you're not using it. Uh, I want to broaden it beyond uh, the terrorist threat to just illegal immigration generally. One of the things that um, is just a little bit mystifying to me is almost the the sequential uh, incursion of people from one country after the other, mostly in our hemisphere. But I mean, if a couple of years ago it was Haitians and you saw thousands and thousands of Haitians uh, on the other side of the border in Texas, on our side of the border, the American side of the border in Texas. And then we had, you know, at the beginning of this administration, and uh, it was Northern Triangle countries, and Kamala Harris was going to go root causes. She was going to go talk to uh, Honduras and El Salvador uh, and Guatemala. We're going to get to the root cause of the uh, migration away from Northern Triangle countries up through Mexico to America. Now, uh, particularly in Chicago, we're talking about mostly Venezuelans. Um, so this is not to it's it's not to pick on one country in particular it's just to say you know how is it that we go from you know sort of one country being uh, the predominant representative of persons trying to enter this country illegal to the next one to the next one to the next one it's almost like it's orchestrated it, it, a lot of it depends what DHS is doing at the time but the um, like for instance D, uh, uh DHS were looking, they awarded D, uh, TPS, temporary protective status, to people from uh, Venezuela. All of a sudden now, we got a flow of people from Venezuela who want to get to the U.S. side of, uh, of the border so they can claim they've been here and, and they want temporary temporary protective status, which means you can get a visa, you can leave here lawfully on a temporary basis. But I can tell you, my 34 years, TPS is never temporary. It always ends up getting extended and extended and extended and never sent them back. So a lot of that has to do with the action of DHS. But, you know, what, it, what I can say, the other day, uh, uh, DHS just had to put the numbers out. They had to be subpoenaed by Congress to get it. But they just put the numbers out, for instance, Mexico. In my day, when I was a border patrol agent in the early 80s, 95% of everybody arrested were from Mexico, now a Central American. But even right. with Mexico even with Mexico being the low, a low denominator, the other day they came out and said the CBP-1 app, that the, the, the legal pathways they created, which isn't legal, and they're going to lose it, they show the high percentage of Mexicans claiming asylum. Now, the chances of a Mexican national getting asylum is pretty much zero. We know that. I mean, we vacation in Mexico. We know how dangerous that country may not be. But the DHS right now is approving asylum applications at, a, at 95% and above. So as, the, as that information gets out, the cartels use it. That now, they're, now they're selling to Mexican nationals, let me get you across the border. You can claim asylum because right now they're at 95% rate. The cartels watch everything we do, DHS. They look at, they get the same reports we get in the media. Then they, that's how they sell their trade. So depending on what's happening at DHS, who's, who's talking about TPS, who's talking about amnesty, who's talking about some sort of government action against the country, the cartels it to the, the cartel sell these people, and they'll give everything they own. They'll sell their house, they'll sell their car, and everything they own to the cartels to get to the United States to take 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 advantage of the giveaway program. The giveaway program changes every few months. So when they when the giveaway program changes, it brings a new population. Yeah, I mean, that's the key point. I, I don't think people appreciate the secondary and tertiary effects when, for example, uh, Biden announces 275,000 work visas for Venezuelan immigrants. 
So that sends a message that resonates back in Venezuela, but it also resonates to these other countries that want to get in line. When when Haitia was beset with political violence, the president of Haiti was assassinated. This was an opportunity for them to flee political repression, and so they they shot the gap then. So you know. Uh, it's one of those things. Don't think that uh, people around the globe are not sophisticated. They're not looking at the cues that are being sent. And if they're not the party that's uh, being primarily advantaged in the moment, then they're going to try to position themselves to be the next in line. Well, these people, people need to understand the criminal cartels in Mexico, the, the you know, the, the big drug cartels, they run like a Fortune 500 company. I mean, these, these, they like they, some of these cartels. They have operations now in over forty countries. So again, they they have people that study what the government does, what our what our political uh, uh, posture is in each country. For instance, we stopped uh, to, uh, working with the, the country of Venezuela because we thought it was, it was being run by dictators, someone that we don't recognize as being the president. They knew our our, our relationship with Venezuela was bad. The cartel saw that. Look. You can get the United States, claim asylum from this terrible dictator in that country. The government's already said he, he, he shouldn't be in that position. You can go to the country and get, claim asylum. If chances are, you're probably going to get it because of the relationship the government has with that. The criminal cartels are very sophisticated, and they follow everything. They read the papers much and more, more than I do. And these guys, it, like, I'll say it again, they're like a Fortune 500 company. That's why they're multi-billion dollar companies. The criminal cartels are making record amount of money drugging, smuggling drugs, record amount of money smuggling people. A record amount of money trafficking, sex trafficking of women and children, and a record amount of money, you know, on 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 the border in paying off the Mexican, you know, other Mexican cartels. The reason there's so much violence in the country of Mexico right now is because the cartels are fighting each other for control of the plazas, area of operation. When you control right. a certain port border, you control everything. You decide what comes in, when it comes in, and where it comes in, and that is they take a mordida. Uh, 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 you have to pay a fee to the cartels to move anything through that border. So these guys, they're sophisticated. They run like a Fortune 500 company, and they're going to be hard to take down by, by just by just means of intelligence. It's going to take someone like President Trump to come in and and tackle them just like he that ISIS in the caliphate. You got to send special ops down there. You got to take these guys out. Mexico's not going to stop them. Mexico's failed to stop this for 30 years. Why? My opinion. Much of the Mexican uh, military is uh, corrupt. Much of the Mexican law enforcement is corrupt. Much of the Mexican government is corrupt. Now, I'm not saying every cop and every soldier or every politician mm-hmm. in Mexico is corrupt, but many of them are. I've done it for 35 years. This is a, there's a reason we don't share all intelligence with Mexico, even if through our vetted unit, because there's certain intelligence we just don't trust them with. Well, right. And I mean, this has been going on for generations, as you say. I mean, it's even popularized now in TV series like Narcos. Um, I want to get just like basics, though, here, too, because this is a word that gets thrown around a lot and um, to to cut through maybe some of the confusion and the misapplication of this word, asylum. Um, You were talking about these asylum applications not going to be granted because I I think you were intimating because they're economic hardship cases and that's not a basis for asylum. Um, There was an exchange you had with uh, AOC uh, back in at the end of the uh, Obama administration that was uh, that was one of the better exchanges in terms of entertainment because you had to explain to her that if somebody comes to here illegally, they're still here illegally if even if they all, all of a sudden want to claim asylum. The way you claim asylum is go through a legal port of entry and file an asylum application. And then we argue about whether you should have to remain at the remain in Mexico policy or you're allowed to stay in the United States pending the adjudication. But I just just break down how asylum works and how it's uh, misidentified by those who essentially favor open borders. Well, first of all, let's understand AOC is probably the dumbest Congress person. <laughs> Congress. I think but we understand that. Yeah. And uh, it, it, for me to have to sit there and explain to her that entering the country illegally is a crime. It's a violation of Title VIII, called 1325. For a United States congressman, to not understand entering this country legally is a crime, I just, I was dumbfounded. Anyway, uh, asylum. Asylum is this. If someone claims asylum, they got to they gotta prove they're escaping fear and persecution from their home government, from state government, because of race, religion, political affiliation, or participation in, in a specific social group. That is what asylum is. 
And here's and and when you come to the board to claim asylum, what should happen is you, you should be detained. And if you're detained, you'll get a hearing within 35 days in front of an immigration judge. You'll make determination. However, if you're not detained, it may take five, seven, up to 10 years, depending on appeals and so forth, because immigration judges prioritize those in detention. That is why they're not detaining these folks. They know if they don't detain them, when they release them, they won't see a judge for five, seven years. By then, they'll have one or two USC kids. They'll have other equities. Then they'll fight for deportation when they get ordered. Here's what the listeners need to know. The, the media keeps calling these people asylum seekers. I guess technically you can call them asylum seekers. They need to know this. Based on immigration court data in the last 10 years, last decade, not nearly 9 out of 10 people who claim asylum on our southern border never get relief from U.S. courts. They simply don't qualify or they don't show up in court and they get an order of removal. Here's what you need to understand. So 9 out of 10 will get an order of removal, whether in absentia, they didn't show up in court, or where they show up in court. But here, here's the second part of that. Why they release them? Because the Homeland Security report that's printed every year by the Department of Homeland Security tracks the immigration life cycle. Here's what that says. If you're in detention, you get order removal. You're removed 99.7% of the time. If you're not in detention, you get order removal. For instance, if you're a family unit, you leave 6% of the time. That's why this administration is releasing people Knowing nine out of ten don't qualify, because they know that nine out of ten will get order removal. But if they're not detained, they're never leaving. That's why they're releasing everybody, and that's why they're not detaining because they want these people to stay. And I tell you, even when I was the ICE director, and I removed somebody, I, I even had Republican senators call me and say, "Why'd you remove that man? He has two USC kids." And I say, "Well, he didn't have two USC kids when he entered the country legally. He didn't have two USC kids when he claimed asylum fraudulently. Now, because he got an order removed when he has two USC kids, now the now the, now the court order doesn't mean anything. Now, he, now he gets amnesty. Now he's immune from law enforcement. Because if that's the case, and that's what you want me to do, then shut down the immigration courts. Because obviously, the immigration judge orders don't mean anything. That's why it's imperative that we detain these people. And under Trump." We got away from the catch and release. We detained them and, and, or we removed them. And that's why I keep people saying, well, what can we do? To, what can we do to slow this down? This administration can slow this down by 80% today. All they got to do is put the Remain in Mexico pro program back in place. The highest courts in the land, it says it's a legal program. They can still claim asylum. They'll still get a hearing, but they're going to wait in Mexico until that hearing happens. And the 9 out of 10 that lose, see you later. The, 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 for the 10 percent that may pass welcome to the united states it's the right thing to do and, it, and it's the safest thing to do and and the remain in mexico policy um that they they still would get ex expedited adjudication uh with respect to their asylum applications yes so i mean it's they're not going to languish in mexico for years waiting for a court date they'll the this uh, oh, these are cases that would, would, these are cases yeah they'll be waiting for months but here, here's the issue if you're really well, escaping, months, that's one thing. If you're really escaping fear and persecution from El Salvador, and you really claim asylum, which is again escaping fear and persecution from your home government, if you're in Mexico, have you not escaped that fear and persecution from the country of El Salvador? Of course you have. Right. You should be claiming asylum in the first free country you come to, and that's what President Trump did. Not only put Remain in Mexico program back in, he made the three Central American co uh, countries and Mexico sign. What they call third safe country was saying if you get to a, a, a safe third country you should be claiming asylum there and all three countries signed that agreement including mexico they didn't want to but president trump said you will or i'm going to pull international aid away from you president trump he didn't play this game he says look if 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 because i i remember sitting in the Oval office and we're going over these numbers wait a minute if nine out of ten don't qualify and only six percent leave why do we keep releasing them so that's when he decided we're going to end catch and release, and we're going to put the Remain in Mexico program in. We're going to put the third safe country again. And let me tell you about Remain in Mexico program. These people know they don't qualify because after Remain in Mexico program was in, and they, they realized they weren't going to get into the United States and caught and released, they stopped coming. They stopped coming. They stopped coming because they knew they were going to just have to wait in Mexico. They stopped coming. If they're really escaping death and persecution, they will still come. They stopped coming.
Right. And even if uh, even if they have to wait months for an adjudication, I mean, think about the people that wait years to try to get into this country legally. I mean, so, you know, a fair is fair, so to speak. Um, w with respect to uh, other people that we don't seem to expel, even though there's almost I, I actually I don't know of any disagreement with respect to this population I'm about to reference. I mean, this goes back to, for me, a 2015 exchange that Ted Cruz had with um, the ICE director under President Obama. Oh, is, did he mm -hmm. drop? They lost the guest. Okay. Uh, they, he's there, but they don't have his video. Oh, okay. Can you ask? T T Tom, can you hear me? Oh, we just lost yeah. you on video there. Okay, so I'll just reset. Okay. No problem, we're good. Um, so uh, just in terms of uh, populations of individuals in this country illegally who there is um, there's some disagreement about what we were talking about, those groups that are seeking asylum or pretending to seek asylum. But there's one group where there's almost no disagreement. And in fact, I, I can't remember anyone disagreeing. And yet it doesn't happen. I, I go back to this exchange at a Senate Judiciary Committee hearing in 2015 that Senator Ted Cruz had with the acting ICE director at the time, the actual ICE director at the time, Sarah Saldana, in which he uh, just looked at the previous fiscal year. There were 193 convicted murderers that were not deported, people here illegally. There were 426 individuals convicted of sexual assault here illegally, not deported. 16,000 DUIs here illegally, not deported. More than 100,000 people convicted of crimes in that fisc that previous fiscal year back in 2015 and they weren't deported and Saldana didn't have an answer for him she had a disagreement about what the number is if the number is one if the number is 10 it's still too many but but I mean this is sort of like baseline baseline if we as a country to me can't accomplish deporting people in this country illegally who commit crimes against Americans or even other people in this country illegally, if we can't bring ourselves to have a system that expedites them out of this country, then, I mean, what are we even talking about with the rest of this? I'm with you 100%. That's why under President Trump, 91% of everybody we arrested and removed from the country, 91% was a convicted criminal. We concentrate on that. Then when this administration came in, Joe Biden, Secretary of Homeland Security, Alejandro Mayorkas, who should have been impeached two years ago, so I wish Republicans get off their ass and get it done. We need to talk about their midterms. Now we don't hear anything about it. I would think since the recent numbers were released, with two point, almost 2.5 million people entering this country, that they do something to them. Anyways, well, now that we got a speaker, maybe we'll get something going on that again. I doubt it. I doubt it. I'm, I've lost faith in a lot of them. But I hope they do. Um, but anyways, so Secretary Mayorkas came into powder, uh, power and he created a new ICE priorities memo. And most of the criminals are off the table now. ICE can't even go look for them. Let's say this. When I was with Trump, the last year I was with Trump, I said 91% were convicted criminals. I looked at that memorandum. Matter of fact, I went to Texas. I testified for the state of Texas as a, as a border expert in their lawsuit against the administration over this policy. I went and testified. I said, if I, what we did in the Trump administration, if criminals were removed, if I looked at the Mallorca's memo, the new, Obama, the new Biden policy, 85% of the people, the criminals we arrested under Trump can't be arrested and removed today because they, they, they narrowed the priorities so low. You got to be convicted of an aggravated felony, right? So you can be an aggravated, you got to be convicted of an aggravated felony, which is the most serious of crimes. So you can be an MS-13 gang member in the country legally, be in the gang in New York City. You can beat the hell out of an old lady, leave her in critical condition, booked into jail, and ICE can't drop a detainer on them, ICE can't talk to them, and ICE can't remove them. We guys have been convicted of an aggravated felony. This administration, they say they're going to concentrate on the worst of the worst. The numbers prove it's a lie. The criminal, criminal arrests and removals are down 48%. The, the most violent criminals is down like 60%. So this administration has, has drawn a line and said, we're going, to, we're going to concentrate on the worst of the worst. What you look at, the actual data, they're removing 40 to 6% less people. So they're not doing it. They're lying to the American people like always. This administration, I've worked for six presidents, starting with Ronald Reagan. Every administration likes to stretch the truth or spin it a little bit. I've never seen an administration stands at the White House podium just outwardly lies to the American people. 
Well, and, and, and on this score, too, I mean, we had that moment um, several years back when you had the tragic killing of Kate Steinle in San Francisco, where people were uh, focused, yeah, yeah, what is somebody who is here illegally doing, and then this, this poor girl is killed because it was it, so easily prevented if we just remove people who are, are criminals or are repeat uh, illegal entrants, as was the case in that case, among many others. And, the, and, and Trump, too, to his credit, profiling the angel families uh, who've had, who were families victimized by people in this country illegally. Seems like we had that moment, and I, I don't know if it's subsided or if it's been subsumed by all the sanctuary city business and what's happening at the border, now what's happening in big cities per Governor Abbott and Governor DeSantis. But I mean, it, it, God, that, that has to be the most demoralizing thing of all to law enforcement, just as the same thing with domestic police. Uh, where you you know somebody is uh, you've seen them before or you know somebody has committed a crime they're tried they're convicted and they're turned away it's almost like the George Soros prosecutors that won't prosecute people who commit crimes I mean it's it's similar to that at the federal level well two things you mentioned uh, the angel Trump really wrapped his arms around angel moms and dads who lost their US citizen children were killed by illegal people being here illegally Chase Steiner was one of them you know, under Trump, we created the victims of immigration crime and the voice the office, or the voice office. We're victims of immigration crime, whether it was your relative, your son, your daughter, your mother, father. You would have constant communication with ICE, and, we, and you would be notified if the person was eligible for parole, when he got released, where he is, what ICE was doing, when ICE is going to remove him from the country. It was a, it was a great program, so we gave some sort of sense of safety and, and, and information to the victims. So they knew that ICE was going to follow up, make sure these people get deported when, they're, when they get out of prison. This administration killed the voice office. They created a different office. Here's the office they created. This office, if you're an illegal alien and you're being order removed, you can call this number now that used to be a voice office and fight your deportation and say why you shouldn't be removed. Why you're why your detention facility you're currently sitting in, the food isn't good enough, or or you know your rights aren't being preserved, or you don't have access to the phone. Or, they, 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 did, they took this office, which was meant for victims of immigrant crime, and turned it into a, a, a hotline for illegal aliens who want to complain about, you know, being deported. It just is sickening. It, it's, it's just, it's, it, it. and look, the men and women of ICE and the men and women of the Border Patrol, their morale is non-existent. The, they have, they're not able to do the job. They're not able to enforce the law. They're not able to uphold the, the oath of office they took. Uh, it's just, in, in, in this administration, doesn't care that the men and men and women of the board show the men and women of ICE have been abandoned by the Secretary of Homeland Security. They've been abandoned by the President of the United States. And when I meet with them, I talk to them. I, I just tell them, you know, just hold out hope. I think in January 2025, a new guy's walking in the White House by the name of Donald Trump, and he's going to let them get back to do their job. And if Trump comes back, I'm coming back, and we will do the job. So uh, it, it, it's hard to get these guys motivated when when they come to work every day to process and release people every single day. And see, the other three weeks ago, they had, they had 11,000 apprehensions in a 24-hour period. You know how many people were removed? 119. 119 out of 11,000. And you want to know why these men and women de demoralized? When I was a border patrol agent, you arrested somebody, they arrested from Mexico, they were back in Mexico within 20 minutes. All you had to do is fill out one sheet of paper, they're back in Mexico. Now, they're processing these people for release, they're taken to the airport. They're flying to the city of their the city of their choice on the taxpayer dime. And once they get there, they're gonna get lodging. They're gonna get three squares a day. They're gonna get medical attention. It's sickening. We got homeless veterans who served this country honorably, and they're and they're homeless and they don't have three squares a day. They don't have a hot shower, air conditioned room in the summertime. But people who violated this country's laws, showed disrespect for this country, are now being taken care of by your taxpayer money. They, they say the NGOs taking care of them. The NGOs get grants from FEMA. Where does FEMA get their money? From the taxpayers. They like to play the switcheroo that, no, no, CBP ain't paying for their care. And are we, are we, the NGOs are taking care of it. Yeah, they're taking care of it through grants, grants from FEMA, from your tax dollars. Right. And and, and some of them, there, I, there was a report by the Heritage Foundation, some of them, uh, it was suggested, are uh, aiding and abetting people coming into this country illegally. And we, I mean, and we know, I, with Catholic Charities in San Antonio, we know they admitted it. They, they were flying uh, uh, migrants uh, that entered illegally up to Chicago because that's where they wanted to go. 
Um, so I mean, so that, you're fun. Yeah. You mentioned I, I got to jump in. You mentioned Catholic Charities, so I was notified several months ago about Catholic Charities down the Rio Grande Valley that there, there was there's people watching what Catholic Charities was doing. You know, again, whistleblowers. They were turning away U.S. citizens are trying to get the Catholic Charities to get a night's sleep or get us sleep in a nice, a warm place for the night or get a meal. They were being turned away because they wanted the illegal, illegal alien population. Why? Because they got paid money. Got paid right. money. It's all about money. So, you know, Catholic Charities, you're right. You know, I'm a senior fellow with Heritage. Heritage does great work. They do a lot of investigative reporting. Heritage is, they're right on the money. This is the NGOs. They, they've been, they, their wallets are thicker now. They've been giving billions of dollars in, in, in sole source contracts. So when the government wants a contract, they usually put out for bid, let people compete. But they're giving billions away, sole source. You, you, don't have to, you don't have to compete. They already know who the war is going to go to. So I've asked the Homeland Security uh, Oversight Committee, with Mark Green as the chairman, I've asked, you need to have oversight hearings on these billions of dollars in contracts that are being awarded to NGOs with a sole source, no competitive, no, no competition. Uh, U.S. companies going to have right to bid on any of this stuff. And, and a lot of this inside trading going on, I've asked Mark Green, you guys need to have a hearing on this because billions of dollars in taxpayers' money is being fraudulently spent, and they need to look into it. Um, you mentioned working in six presidential administrations. Go go back to Reagan. Um, the 1986 uh, immigration legislation that provided essentially amnesty for about three million people that had been living in this country for some time illegally. Um, and in exchange, it was uh, cracking down on companies hiring people illegally. It put more onus on businesses to uh, not hire people in this country illegally. Was did, did that turn out to be a big mistake? Did that set a pre, did that set a poor precedent in your view? Yeah, it was bad because with with that enough, we were excited about worksite enforcement, but we weren't given the money positions to do it. I worked, I did worksite enforcement. We were never given an additional position to do it. We we're ever given the money to do it, and they didn't require e verify. I mean, uh, employers they can simply say when you go and arrest the people at the worksite, they can simply say, "I didn't know he's illegal." Yeah, I filled out the I nine. I didn't know that's a fraudulent green card. I didn't know that was a fraudulent driver's license. I'm not an expert, and that was your easy out. So what should have been done is E-Verify should have been put into the law and being required. Now, E-Verify isn't perfect. It can be beat by a few smart people, but it, 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 would, it would be a game changer if they would put that in place. Right And today, the Secretary of Mayorkas, again, has told ICE they can't, they can't do worksite enforcement operations. That, that's off, that, that is off the table now. Unless there's some information on trafficking or, or, or abuse, they can't go to a work site just to check people's uh, work authorization. They're, they're not allowed to do that. That was taken off the table with 85% of the criminals. They don't want the law enforced. And they made that perfectly clear. Because And I didn't opt on that when they when he made that decision. Look at it. When I do work site enforcement operations, we do find victims of trafficking. That's how you find them. You, you do find known, known criminals because they got a job because no one knows who they were. We got a, we made a lot of arrests at worksite enforcement operations because some of the people there were victims of trafficking. So you can actually arrest the, the manager, the owner for trafficking because he he was making these people work and not paying them and taking advantage of them. It's it's, it's terrible what this administration has done. Enforcement of our immigration laws are at a standstill. ICE I talk to ICE agents all the time. They're bored to death. They got nothing to do because the targets they used to have, they no longer have. Uh, I want to add one more comparison since you were part of so many administrations. And as I mentioned at the outset, uh, you were uh, promoted under President Obama. Um, the Obama administration to the Biden administration. Is there any real difference in disposition towards uh, border security? Absolutely. Um, uh, really? under, under, under Obama, the first, year, first four years under Obama, it was good. Uh, matter of fact, in FY12, ICE removed 409,000 illegal aliens, a record for the agency, still stands today. Uh, the last four years, I guess the left got to him, called him the, the reporter in chief, and he did a complete 180. Well, here's what I'll say about the Biden administration is completely off the charts from the Obama administration. You know, in, um, in FY14 and 15, under Obama administration, we had a family surge, uh, uh, thousands of families coming across. How would we stop that? We stopped it by building facilities to hold them, uh, family residential centers, not a jail, like open campus, family residential centers, 
We held them long enough to see a judge. 90% lost your case, like we discussed before. We put on an airplane and sent them home. At that time, but Joe Biden was, was the vice president. Alejandro Mayorkas was the deputy secretary. Now, Biden's the president. Mayorkas is the secretary. What are they doing now? The complete opposite. They're not detaining them. They're not making them see a judge. And the ones that actually show up to see a judge, they get order removal. They're not being removed because Mayorkas has said several times, not only in the media, but during speeches and to ICE, that being in the country illegally on its own is not enough for ICE to go look for you and arrest you. So these two men are doing the complete opposite of what they know worked in 2014 and 15 when we had the same situation under President Obama. So, yeah. This is this administration is the worst I've ever seen. I haven't seen, they haven't done a single thing to slow the flow. And let me add this: they want to say the Trump uh, uh, administration was inhumane. Well, since Joe Biden's been president, they've lost nearly eight hundred thousand. Uh, I mean, they, they've lost nearly one hundred thousand children. They released three hundred three hundred sixty thousand children entered the country illegally under Biden. They released some so-called sponsors. They can't find nearly hundred thousand children right now that they release the sponsors. I can tell you right now, based on my 35 years experience, some of these children are in forced labor, some are in sex trafficking, some are living with pedophiles, some are in gangs. That's just that's just a stone cold fact. Not all of them, but many of them. They're living on a life of hell right now. On top of that, we've had over 1,700 migrants have died on US soil, either drowning in the river, dying in the desert, or being killed by the cartels. These policies that Biden has, a record number of Americans are dying, over 100,000 from fentanyl, Record number of migrants are dying, over 1,700. The sex trafficking women and children all time high. They can't find 100,000 children. This policy ain't inhumane. They're terrible. And, and President Trump's policies, let it say inhumane, but let, let's set the record straight. Doctors Without Borders did a study saying 31% of women who make that journey through the use of cartels get sexually assaulted. Trump had illegal immigration down 83 to 90%, depending on what time frame you looked at. So let me ask you a question. When, when, when 90% people, or less people are coming, when 90% less people are coming, how many women weren't being raped? How many children weren't dying? How many Americans didn't die from fentanyl overdoses? How many known suspected terrorists didn't cross the border? President, policy, President Trump's policies saved lives. President Biden's policies are taking lives at record numbers. Yeah, I mean, that's a key point um, because, of course, uh, anybody who... Uh, favors uh, some board, uh, uh, favors border security, favors the enforcement of immigration laws. Uh, even if you know the pro-immigration, but enforce the laws, you know you get the xenophobe business from the open borders crowd. And I mean, you wrote a, a book about it, defend the border and save lives. That's such a key component of this. It's not about being punitive towards anyone. It's actually the same principle that applies domestically on American soil. You enforce the laws and you prevent people from being victimized. Pretty simple. Right. Exactly. And I wrote that book because I want people to understand that secure border saves lives. And Trump proved that. And let me tell you something about the border wall. People say the border wall was a vanity project. It was Trump. That wasn't Trump. Trump got that idea from the border patrol. The border patrol, yes. He, he actually asked the people who did the job, what do you need to help stem the flow? They said a border wall. Border walls aren't made to stop everybody. They're made to slow people down. If you touch that wall, we're going to know. If you dig under the wall, we're going to know. If you climb the wall, we're going to know. Because it's a smart wall. I won't tell you all the technology in it, but it's a smart wall. But some people can get over that wall. You know, a young a young guy can get up and there's certain ways he can get over it. You know, not not many, but few can do it. However, yeah. what's important is that the most vulnerable people, the women and children, can't climb the wall. But what's, what's that force them to do? That forces them to go to the place where there's not a wall. And what's waiting for them? The men and women of the Border Patrol, who can take care of them, because a lot of these people are in bad shape. That, that wall saves a lot of lives, because it forces the most vulnerable, the most, the most, the old, the infirm, the ones who aren't feeling good, the ones who are going through some medical crisis. It forces them to go where there's not a wall, so the Border Patrol can take care of the humanitarian causes, and they have them. So walls save lives. People, not, I, I read, I read something in the paper the other day saying, well, apparently. Trump's wall didn't work because we got record immigration, even though he built almost 500 miles of wall. Well, that's a stupid thing to say because the second question should say, ask, where are they crossing right now? They're crossing where there isn't a wall. So if walls do work, and, and, and when Trump gets back in office, we're going to finish that wall. Uh, so I want to go to, to the sanctuary I one more city. Thing. I one more thing. Let me add one more thing about the walk. I'm sick and tired of people like Chris yeah. Christie, 
And Ron DeSantis is saying Trump promised Mexico pay for the wall. They didn't pay for the wall. They did. And here's how they did it. When Mexico entered in the, the, the Remain in Mexico program, when they entered in third safe country agreements, when they put military in the southern border, northern border and didn't fight the wall construction because President Trump told them they wouldn't, they couldn't, and he, and he wasn't going to allow it, that saved billions of dollars in detention costs, billions of dollars in enforcement costs, billions of dollars in immigration costs, billions of dollars in transportation and removal costs. So what, what President Trump made Mexico do in coordination with this country saved the taxpayers billions of dollars. So maybe they didn't pay for the wall directly, but because of the wall and what Trump did with Mexico, we saved billions of dollars in immigration expenses. Uh, what, speaking of DeSantis, uh, let me uh, include Governor Abbott of Texas in that as well, uh, is what they have done, mostly Abbott, but DeSantis did as well, in sending uh, people in this country, entering this country illegally to places like New York City and Chicago to um, have those uh, sanctuary cities uh, bear the brunt of the policies they champion. Has that been a positive development? Has that made this issue more salient for more Americans and been positive? Or do you think that the, uh, uh, the chaos that it's causing in places like New York and Chicago is uh, on balance negative when it comes to the overall issue of border security? It was a genius move. It was a genius move by Governor Abbott, and I know he popped on the bandwagon after a while. It was a good move because what it done is made Democrat governors and Democrat mayors start raising hell. And it, 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 it showed that their sanctuary city policies were for political purposes only. When they actually get people to go want to be part of the sanctuary city, they're pushing back. So look, governor, like guys like uh, uh, Mayor Adams in New York, you know, he, he as a career cop. He should be ashamed of himself. He should take his uh, retired badge and, and hide it in the desk drawer because he stopped being a law enforcement officer and became a politician because even though he's complaining about all these migrants coming to town being bust by Republican governors, he never said a word. When the Biden administration were flying people in the middle of the night to his state, never said a word. Never said a word about all, all, the, all the aliens that Biden administration sent him. His only Republican governor sent it to him. And I'll say this about New York City. They're going to go to New York City anyways. Whether Abbott takes them or, or Biden sends them, they're going to New York City anyways. That's one of the, that's one of their final destinations. Why is it? Because they're sanctuary city. They can go there. They can get uh, the city will help them financially to, to fight their immigration case. They can get lodging. They can get food. Uh, they can get a driver's license. They can get in-state tuition, and they even, they can even get arrested for a crime and get booked into Rikers Island, and no one's going to call ICE. When I was ICE director, I, I had a dozen guys signed up to Rutgers Island. We were removing hundreds of illegal aliens a week, not only from the neighborhoods, from the country, so they couldn't reoffend in the community. Now, ICE was kicked out of Rutgers Island because they're a sanctuary city, so criminal aliens who commit crimes against U.S. citizens will be locked in Rutgers Island, and they will be, they'll be released to uh, you know commit another crime uh, a week or two down the road against a U.S. citizen because they're a sanctuary city. If, 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 if an illegal alien knows you can get there, you'll be protected, you can get lodging, you can get food, you can get a driver's license, you can get a job, you can even get arrested and no one's going to call ICE, why the hell wouldn't you go to New York City? So New York City mess is the reason why New York City is, is ranked the third uh, highest illegal alien population is because it's a welcoming city and they welcome them. So guess what? You asked for it, now you got it. If you want to change it, change your sanctuary city policy. Don't make it comfortable for them and call the White House and demand they do their job. In Chicago, uh, we'll do we'll go one better with all those benefits. You talk about nine thousand dollars in rental assistance for six months, uh, uh, help with moving costs. I don't know exactly what somebody in Caracas needs to move from Caracas, what they came with to move from Caracas to Chicago and uh, a, a starter set of furniture for their place. Now, we're not providing that to uh, American citizens who live in Chicago, but we are to, I mean, so this is, I mean, to your point, just to accentuate the insanity that you have people despite the protesting. And by the way, according to a Siena poll that just came out, very low marks for Biden, for uh, Adams, for Hochul in New York City and New York State and at the federal level on this issue. And it's one of these issues that's unifying even a leftist state like New York, maybe to a lesser extent, Illinois. But, um, it was very interesting, three years ago, uh, in advance of the 2020 election, 
Biden was up on Trump 61 to 29, 61%, 29%. The Siena poll uh, out this week, 46, 37 Biden. 20, you know, two point move in the last three years. And it's mainly because of this issue. It's very interesting that people's lifestyles are being impinged upon. They're starting to change their tune about some of these politicians they otherwise supported. But, uh, but uh, just to, to play devil's advocate, to, on the downside, what we see in Chicago, my hometown, is police stations that are overrun with uh, people here illegally sleeping on the floors because the city has no plan. Uh, Ten cities out front of police stations. Uh, you've got, obviously, the state doing the same thing the federal government's doing, dangling money in front of municipalities to take migrants uh, and come up with uh, innovative ways to provide housing for them, particularly as we move into the winter. Same thing for New York. And so, again, is it just one of those things? Well, yeah, there's going to be some pain and there's going to be some pain inflicted on people who don't deserve it. But, hey, that's the culture in these particular cities. And that's what's required to potentially, potentially instigate a change. Well, look, it's worse than that because um, our hospitals are being overrun. Uh, right. Most schools. don't have it. Most of them don't have insurance, so the hospitals, they can't absorb millions of dollars of loss. How are they going to make that money up? By charging more to the insurance companies. So our insurance premiums are going to continue to skyrocket. So Because, look, the American taxpayer is going to lose. Insurance companies not going to lose. You, you can bet you, you can bet, you, you bet that. And the hospitals aren't going to lose. You can bet that. But like, like, like last month in Yuma, Arizona, every maternity bed in that hospital was filled with an illegal alien giving birth to a future U.S. citizen. American citizen women could not give birth in a hospital for a period of time. They had to go to another hospital. There's no room for them. And look, I know they need the medical attention, but this just points out that if they're, 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 the, 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 the hospitals are overcrowded, school systems are overcrowded, uh, and, and, you know, in, in the school systems, many of these children entering our school system, like in New York City, have never had a single vaccination. Whether it's rubella, polio, hepatitis A, B, I know when I put my kids in school, I had to show a vaccination record. There's there's a thousands of these kids in schools now without a single vaccination, so it puts our public uh, public health at risk. And look, if someone's in this country need medical attention, they should get it. it you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not going to be a, a person who want to see someone die because we won't get medical attention. However, we must understand we can't be the welfare nation for the entire world. Someone's going to pay that cost, and who's going to pay the cost is People that have uh, uh, health insurance, those who can't get into a hospital, there's no room. Those who have to wait after uh, an hour in the emergency room because there's a bunch of people in front of them more than ever. And the school system, what used to be a, a class of 20 in New York City, is now a class of 45. It's going to affect the, the taxpayers of this country. It's going to, and it's going to affect their lifestyle. It's just you right. know, it's the amount of money New York spending right now. The New York City taxpayers, are, you know, not New York City, New York State, with Governor Hochul giving millions of dollars away too uh, taxpayers are going to put the bill for this it's not going to be anybody else but the taxpayers the government keeps dangling all these big checks for these little municipalities to take these people but it all comes down where does the government get that money from they get from us right but and but i mean look uh it's fun to run around uh, spouting these fortune cookie bromides like no person can be illegal well here are the implications of that sort of you know woozy uh fashionable position this is, this is what it looks like when no one is illegal, when there's no difference between an American citizen and somebody here illegally. In point of fact, as we're sort of documenting, um, some of the benefits for people here illegally are better than those available to American citizens. Well, in 2025, we're going to prove to American people that we know who's, who, who, here's, who's here illegally and who's not. I said it before, if Donald Trump gets back in the White House, I, I, I already committed to going back. And for all these millions of people being released in the country, going back know, to be ICE know. director. No, I'm you know I'm going to show Kamala Harris how to be a border czar, and uh, that's my hope. <laughs> that's my hope. <laughs> all these millions being released, you know what? Don't get too comfortable because you, if you've been ordered out out of this country, we're we're going to look for you. And uh, there has to be a consequence for illegal behavior. If there's no consequence for illegal behavior, illegal behavior won't stop. We have this country for. This country has to stand by, we're a nation of laws, and, and this country is showing over and over again, you hang out long enough, go, go into hiding for you know, 10, 12 years, and we'll give you something. We'll give you amnesty, we'll give you doctrine, we'll give you something. we got to stop rewarding a little behavior. 
Because if we keep doing that, people won't, you know, our laws are a joke. They're just going to come here illegally. They'll get ordered deported. They'll go into hiding. They'll have a couple of two USC kids, and they'll wait for the next giveaway. We have to have consequences. And here's a question that they should ask Mayorkas when Mayorkas says, will they have a right to claim asylum? And when he's testifying in front of Congress, I wish I was a congressman because I would ask him this. Okay, they have a right to claim asylum. We all agree to that. We're disagreeing how they go about it. They should be waiting for Mexico for it. But anyways, if we all agree to have a right to claim asylum, if, if the final decision of the court is they must be removed after they had due process that great taxpayer expense, if the federal courts order removed, Secretary Marcus, should they be removed? Even if we found them four or five years later because they went in hiding, should they be removed? Because if they're not removed, if, if, the, if the court order doesn't mean anything, the due process means squat. We have to abide by the final decision of the courts. That's the question you should ask him. I'd like to see his answer. So if Trump is back in and you're back in, we can't use, I, we got to stop using czar. I don't know why we use terms of Russian royalty to describe uh, officials in this country, but you're the border guy, border guy, Tom Holman, the border uh, patrol. Um, that's, my, that's my hope and I only volunteered for it. I told him I was so pissed off, I'll come back for free. <laughs> Good. Um, you have the expertise as you're demonstrating here, the knowledge of this, so we, you know, we could use all hands on deck here. Um, are there areas of compromise? For example, I mean, Trump was willing to, because even if you have Republicans with control of, of Congress, on this issue, there are so many cross currents that are, 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 po are you know, not strictly limited to the partisan divide, that it's complicated if you really want to sort of holistically reform how we do immigration and border security in this country. So, for, and, and by compromising, I'm thinking of what President Trump offered uh, Democrats when he was in office, which is he was going to provide uh, legal protection to uh, some million and a half dreamers, uh, kids who were brought here illegally by their parents, but you know, the, the whole through no fault of their own, in exchange for the five billion and change that he wanted to complete funding of the construction of the border wall. I mean, are those the kind of compromises that we should be willing to contemplate to try to advance the flag on this? Well, of course, that's to be compromised. You know, um, to remove 20 million people is, is, you know, virtually impossible. But of course, that's to be compromised. Look, the, doc, the dreamers, you know, uh, my kids have a dream too. So, uh, I hate the word dreamers because all kids have dreams. But if you know, if if they didn't normally violate the law, they came, they came in, or his parents brought him in as a child or a baby. I get, it. and maybe there's some compromise down the road, but there should be zero compromise until we secure this border. Like right now, um, if I was a member of Congress, I was a Republican member of Congress. I wouldn't be sitting down talking about a spending bill. I wouldn't be talking about an infrastructure bill. I wouldn't be given. I wouldn't be sitting down with the Democrats and negotiate anything. Until they show me one thing they, they're going to do is to secure the border. Look, this security border, like I said before, it's just not about illegal immigration anymore. This is the biggest national security failure this country has seen since 9-11. Do something to secure that border. I'm not going to negotiate squat with you. And you know what? Now that we have the house, we have the purse strings, we'll shut it down. Shut the government down. People say, well, that's, well, that, that's pretty drastic. Well, how drastic does it have to get? When we know that no inspector terrorists are being arrested at record numbers on our border, how do guys have to get? If, if they can penetrate the most sophisticated wall system Israel has, which is just as good as our wall system, wall system actually some of the technology might even be better, if they can penetrate them and they have an intelligence barrier there, you don't think the same thing happened to us, especially when 70 to 90% of the agents are off the line? This is a point. So how bad it's got to get? We're there. So Congress needs to demand action or shut it down. That's my opinion. And so just to, to put a fine point on it, because um, we've talked about a lot of issues related to securing the border. It's not a one, it's not a one uh, policy solution. So, what, so what, what would you consider meeting the threshold of securing the border to then open negotiations on other related topics? What, what, were the, well, what would the components of that be? Finish your wall and policy changes. Look, what's happening on the border right now is not a resource issue. It's a policy issue. If they would simply go back to the Trump policies that gave us the most secure border in our lifetime, we'd be there. I'd require, you know, uh, re re restart the Trump policy, stay proven effective, mandate e-verify, finish the wall. Then we'll talk about 
what you want to do what, as far as future immigration. But we need to remember, we got millions of people standing in line, paying their fees, taking their tests, doing their vaccinations, doing everything they're supposed to do to enter this country illegally. They want to be a part of the greatest nation on earth, and they're, they're, and they're making all the sacrifices going through the legal system. These millions of people are sitting in the back row now because CIS, the agency is in charge of making giving people visas, giving people green cards, making people U.S. citizens. They're so tied up with this fraudulent asylum swarm right now that people, legitimate people are trying to be a part of this greatest nation on earth the legal way are sitting in the back seat. So people need to remember all this, all this uh, uh, historic illegal immigration crisis on our border is hurting those that want to be a part of this country and do it the right way. I was in a car in New York not too long ago. The, the man recognized me. He was from uh, an African nation. He said, I came here as a student uh, legally. Then I became uh, 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 a, a visa holder. Then I became a resident alien. Then I became a citizen. All the legal way. I got a wife and, and I think it was three boys that I want to bring into the country. I've been working at this for, for several years, and it's just a slow process, and I, I'm not, it doesn't seem like I'm getting very far. And I watch TV and find families coming across the border every day, being released by the government, being transported by the government, getting food and housing by the government. It makes me wonder why I follow this system. And I asked my sister, so why are you following the system? He goes, I love, my, I love this country. This is my country now. I want to respect this country. I want to do things the right way. People like this, that, that gentleman that drove me around in New York, uh, there's there's thousands upon thousands upon thousands of people in the United States that want that. They, they want to finish bringing their, their families over the legal way, but what this administration has done is 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 just disregarded those folks and let's take care of the mass illegal immigration on the southern border by rewarding them for committing crimes and into this country illegally. He is former acting director of ICE under President Trump, who may be back on the job if President Trump is back on the job after November of next year. Tom Homan, thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. Great talk. Okay, thanks for having me. Please like this video and subscribe to this channel if you haven't already. And please leave a comment in the comment section. We'd love to hear your thoughts.